Hello to everybody. Uh, here we are again with uh, our new latest session of EJ Live, together with Jan Klavers. I get the impression that maybe instead of the European Journal of International Law, it should become the Clubbers Journal of International Law. This is the second uh, EJ Live that we are doing with Jan Klavers, but the occasion uh, is special because uh, Jan Klavers is the first author of a new rubric uh, which is to become a permanent feature in the in EGIL in the first issue of each year, which is the forward. Uh, a word about the forward. Uh, obviously, we unashamedly borrowed the name from the famous forward to the Harvard Law Review. Uh, we didn't get their permission, but we just went ahead and did it. Uh, and this is how the idea came to our mind. We were sitting one day with our joint editorial and scientific uh, advisory board, all our meetings, we joined the two groups together. And somebody raised the question, who had read in recent years a general course at The Hague? Uh, when I was a student, that was almost uh, obligatory reading because it was not just reading a general course, but a general course was giving a scholar the possibility of making his or her giving his or her personal take on the state of the field, on international law, on their approach to international law. And it was interesting uh, from that point of view, as well as reading a general course in international law. And it turns out, for good or bad reasons, that the general habit of reading the general course at The Hague has declined. Very, very few people around the table were willing to say that they had read more than two general courses in the last 10 years. And I still think that the general course is a marvelous institution, and some of them are really worth the time spent reading them. But if, in fact, uh, the state of the field and the prof profession and reading habits of people today have changed, that uh, that kind of heavy tome is less popular, we thought it would be a good idea once a year to give a distinguished scholar, and by distinguished I mean not only somebody who has a spectacular CV, but somebody who has something interesting to say, the possibility of writing a longer article in which he or she would make the kind of statement about the field, about the discipline, about their take on the field that was between the lines in the general course. And that's why we thought of the Harvard Forward and adapting it to the European Journal of International Law and inviting a scholar, giving them more space, so instead of our usual 15,000 words, up to 40,000 words, and saying, please write something with significant systemic importance, disciplinary importance, and try it try to relate it also to things that have happened either in the discipline or in the field itself in the last year or two, so that it would have that kind of contemporary field. And Jan Klabers very graciously, at reasonably short notice, agreed to step in and write the first forward. So there's a little bit of history in the making, and we want to thank you for it. And the title you have given to your piece is the transformation of international organizational law. So maybe my first question is, if we talk about the transformation of something, there should be the possibility of saying, this is how it was before, and this is how it is now. It has been transformed in some significant way. And maybe for our uh, viewers and listeners on uh, the iPod version, you could explain succinctly, so what's the transformation? How was international institutional law? How was it? And how is it today after this transformation? Um, I think the transformation is actually still ongoing and will probably go on for another couple of decades. Uh, so to speak of after the transformation might be a bit premature. But the, the general gist of the piece is that international organizations law was uh, dominated, extremely dominated, one might say, by a functionalist approach, by the idea that international organizations are set up in order to perform functions, and that most of the law relating to international organizations was related to those functions. 
to this idea of there being a function which needed support, which needed facilitation, and that the transformation that is underway now entails that somehow that functionalist orientation is dropping out of sight a bit because practical events, uh, current events and not so current events have suggested that one cannot solve all legal issues by referring to the function of the international organization. And this holds true in particular with the, the discussion that has been blooming for about two decades or so now on responsibility and accountability of international organizations, which simply resists being cast in that functionalist framework. Hold on a minute, and I don't mean to catch you in your words. But the way you framed it now, you say there's a transformation, that original functional approach is dropping out because we have begun to realize, or international uh, law has begun to realize, or international organizations have begun to realize that not all problems can be solved by this functionalist approach. That is a functionalist approach, which is to say yeah. there are problems and therefore we have to find a solution. That is a functionalist approach. It might be a different functionalist approach, but it's still a functionalist approach. And that's fair enough, but it's a different functionalism so, then. Yeah. So, so maybe, as I say, it wasn't a, meant to be a trick question. So maybe you can flesh out, flesh out to us, uh, uh, maybe with an example or two, what, how the classical functional approach used to function, What's, what are the roadblocks that it encountered, and what have been the set of solutions in motions, the new type of thinking uh, which is coming into play, which would not have come into play under the old functionalist approach, just to, to, bring it into, to bring it to life. And you have a couple of examples in the paper, so maybe you might want to use them. I have a, a big example with the, the Haitian cholera crisis, uh, which I devote, what is it, 20 pages or so to in the, in the manuscript which suggests that the classic functionalism does not provide a satisfactory answer to concerns that arise in that context. As is well known, um, Nepalese peacekeepers have been seriously um, suspected of having brought cholera to Haiti a couple of years ago. And as a result, some 8,000 people have died, uh, 100,000 or so have fallen ill and thankfully recovered. Um, as a result, lawsuits have been brought, in particular in, uh, in the New York courts, with, uh, against the United Nations. Like first, some of the victims tried to get relief from the UN directly. That didn't work. So they've started legal proceedings against the UN, and the UN claims immunity. Now, immunity typically is a functionalist uh, given the whole rationale behind the immunities of international organizations is that organizations should be allowed to function without interference and typically judicial activity would be considered interference. So international organizations have long had the position of being able to say, okay, stop, this is as far as it goes. We claim we invoke immunity. We can do that on the basis of our legal, of our constitution, of our general legal instruments. And that is effectively the end of that. And that's an unsatisfactory state of affairs from a number, number of angles. And it is my contention in the piece that um, this is one manifestation of where functionalism hits a wall, where it hits a limit. You cannot, within functionalism, uh, in the law of international organizations, you cannot do justice, quite literally perhaps, to the position of those victims. Um. Uh, and, and how does that translate? Maybe one, one can restate this uh, in conceptual theoretical terms. What, how would you describe the old functionalist approach in conceptual and theoretical terms and then compare it to the new developments which you say are maybe a new type of functionalism, uh, etc.? Yeah, I'm not sure whether I would use the term new type of functionalism for this because I tend to think that the very, uh, as, as you said, it's from a different level, it's, it's a functionalist approach. But at the risk of, of semantics, I'm not sure that that's a very helpful uh, characterization. In this sense... Let, the, let's start uh, with the yeah. old. Give us just a kind of quick primer 
on old functionalism. Old function. Classical functionalism. Classical functionalism started about a century ago, a little bit over a century ago, in the writings of people like Paul Reinsch, of whom we've had a about whom we've had a conversation earlier here. And the underlying idea was clearly that international organizations were set up to perform functions. Those functions were considered useful for, from a broader societal point of view, and thus nothing should impede those functions. Hence, uh, that helps explain the privileges and immunities of international, organiza international organizations. Sorry, That helps explain their almost unlimited uh, powers that they can claim, because it's been only been very recently that courts have put a stop to implied powers claims of international organizations. That helps explain why organizations were in a position to set conditions for membership. All of that trace is traced, can be traced back to the function of the organization. That now, uh, but there's two, two strands here. One is to, to say that that was never very plausible, and I would be subscribing to that. That, uh, or at least, when Reins wrote, and from his mindset, it was still pl plausible, but thereafter it quickly became less plausible because you can already see in the 1920s with the experience of the League of Nations that functionalism could never be applied in pure form. There's always political elements creeping in, if creeping in would be the right term to use. That sounds more pejorative than I mean it. So that is the one angle that, or the one strand of the discussion, that maybe that functionalism was never terribly plausible, but it has been extremely popular amongst international organizations, lawyers and academics looking at international organizations law because it did have a lot of explanatory force. Not the full 100% perhaps, but generally speaking, one can explain the emergence of privileges and immunities and their maintenance by means of functionalist reasoning. One can explain membership criteria with the help of functionalism. One can explain uh, compulsory financing by member states with the help of functionalist ideas. One can help uh, explain treaty making by international organizations with the help of functionalism. So there has always been a strong explanatory force. But it wasn't only explanatory, if I may interrupt a minute. I always felt that the popularity of the functionalist approach among international lawyers was not only because of explanatory power, but also because of a certain ideological and normative yeah, take, yeah. since for the most part, especially after the Second World War, international organizations were considered as a positive development, as uniting for peace. So everything good happened through international organizations. Mm -hmm. So the functional approach was very empowering of international organization. If you look at competences and powers, everything that is needed to fulfill their function should be implied. So I think there was also that ideological yeah. normative tint yeah, that's clearly visible in the literature. There's a wonderful quote from Nagendra Singh from his uh, PhD thesis, I think it was, on termination of membership of organizations, where he says in the foreword that international organizations were set up to help ensure the salvation of mankind, and that captures the atmosphere quite nicely. So international organizations could not do any wrong. And that picture, that international organizations could not do any wrong, and it was a little bit, not explicitly, but I also remember an early article by Nathan Feinberg on withdrawal from international organizations. Mm. Complicated. He, he, he wrote, uh, when you get married, you don't settle the terms of divorce. And then states found that it's actually not easy to withdraw from an international organization, yep. almost like a Catholic marriage. Yep. Once you're in, you're in, because it's salvation of mankind. It's the salvation of mankind. It's for the greater good of humanity. So once you're in, you're in. And if you want to get out, you're seen to dilute your contribution to the common good. So yet there has been a very strong normative comp uh, element component, which I think you're absolutely right in suggesting has uh, appealed to international lawyers generally quite, uh, quite enormously. So the explanatory force combined with the normative appeal meant that there have been very few non-functionalist organization lawyers. The only one I can think of is Finn Sajostad, who uh, more or less explicitly labeled himself as a non-functionalist. But he has always been pretty much on his own. And everyone else, uh, whether uh, 
intentionally or not, whether consciously or not, has adopted, myself included, has adopted elements of functionalism. Um, but functionalism has this problem with controlling the activities of international organizations that simply never was part of the deal other than control by the member states. And that now does not seem to work in the light of the emergence or the recognition perhaps of the relevance of actors other than the member states who might want to have a say and who might justifiably want to have a say in what the organization does and how it is doing things. It's one thing to say that the, the IMF for the World Bank should be responsible to be held accountable to its member states, and that's fine. But those member states will have different criteria of accountability than, for instance, the poor and dispossessed in uh, Nicaragua or Bangladesh or wherever the World Bank or the IMF is operating. And those schisms have become visible over the last 20 or 30 years. And in the piece, I trace that in structural terms, at least, to, uh, to the advisory opinion of the International Court on the uh, World Health Organization's regional headquarters in Alexandria, which led to, uh, or the problem, of, problem there was that Alexandria, being in Egypt, was no longer a favored place for the World Health Organization to have uh, its regional headquarters. So the World Health Organization wanted to terminate the host agreement with Egypt, um, and that caused a bit of a stir, which went a bit unnoticed at the time. Because Egypt is not just a member of the organization, Egypt was also a treaty partner on an equal footing with the World Health Organization. So to simply solve it from the perspective of World Health Organization law turned out to be impossible, or at least the International Court recognized that doing so would do an injustice to Egypt as treaty partner and that seemed to suggest, in that episode, that functionalism cannot cater to outside actors, cannot cater to outside relations of the organization, relations of the organization in the external world, because it cannot give a voice to those external actors. That makes some sense? But I, I, I want to push a little bit further. I think there are two other trends in the field that might explain the transformation that you are discussing. And I, I, I am uh, persuaded that the word transformation is not an exaggeration. And I also take your correction that it's an ongoing process. It's not as if it's happened and we're in a new world. And probably I would add that it's not as if we would eliminate all the overnight all the old functionalist element, but we would add some additional layers to it. So here are, I want, let me test on you two, two ideas that might uh, uh, additionally explain, and it, some of them are sort of woven into your paper itself. So one is uh, the, the new sensibility to the notion of international governance, global administrative law, and all that stuff. So it's never been clear in my mind if that's a conceptual development that from the beginning international organizations were in the business of governance. We just never called it with that. We never recognized it. We were still under the old treaty notion that they are just executing an agreement among their parties, etc. Or the alternative is that given the proliferation of international organizations and given the widening of their scope in part as a result of the functionalist approach, they are increasingly in the business of governance. And a measurement of that governance is the amount of internal norms or areas of public life which we find are regulated by uh, rules or norms or standards that originate from international organizations. And going hand in hand with that sensitivity to the governance function of international organization is the realization that international law and international institutional law hasn't been particularly successful at translating our habits of democratic legitimacy to international governance. And suddenly, instead of being an unqualified good in terms of the progress of mankind, etc., there begin to be voices, and increasingly powerful voices, that do not come from the nationalist court corner, the sort of, you know, the Jesse Helms corner of uh, who are these outsiders to tell us, the United States, what to do, but 
a voice which says, here is important function of governance, and they really, where's the accountability, where's the transparency, where's the de at least the equivalent of democratic legitimacy when we find the very same norms, the very same forms of governance when they occur within democratic states. Once you have that development, then you begin to realize that part of the problem lies in functionalism, that both the increase in scope, the increase in the effectiveness you know, this drive in the 90s, 80s and 90s, and even into 2000, that, uh, you know, the constitutionalization of international organizational law, everybody should be like the EU with direct effect and supremacy. There's a really big pushback from a democratic point of view. And then when you start thinking about it, functionalism is the culprit. So they, that might be one development mm -hmm. Uh, that explains this uh, new mefiance or suspicion or, uh, if you want, waking up. And the second one uh, are all manner of constructivist theory. When we discover that international organizations develop a life in their own, that the agents in international organizations begin to shift their loyalty, that principal agent theories do not explain any longer the behavior of international organization, that it's difficult to track international organization activity as servants of the member states who are members of the organization. And as I say, different forms of constructivist theory would support that and with the same result, that in this case, the functionalism loses ex its explanatory power. So you take both these developments, governance as a normative challenge to functionalism and constructivism as an explanatory challenge to functionalism. It's not because they're fulfilling their function, it's because they've developed an identity of their own and then people like to exercise power. And I think this kind of adds to suddenly we're in a different world. So uh, this is a... I can only subscribe to that, Jan. Both those thoughts are in the paper to a considerable extent, mm -hmm. not in the same systematic way as you know, now point them out. So I follow a different uh, narrative, if you will, slightly different narrative. But they're both there, both the turn to governance and the, uh, the resulting call for accountability and uh, legitimacy is there, as well as, uh, as the other you mentioned. Yeah. So, so now I think our viewers, our listeners would sort of get the drift of uh, the reasons for transformation, the reason why there's a certain challenge to or disillusionment, disillusionment with classical functionalism. How would you describe what is the replacement? Because constructivism is not the theory that replaces it. It's a theory which explains why there's dissatisfaction with yep. it. And governance, again, is a theory, is, is an optic which explains. But what is, how would you describe what is replacing functionalism? And, and that, I was a bit tongue in cheek when I said a new functionalism. It's, mm. I, I, I <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure anything is replacing it just yet. The battle seems to be still ongoing and it's too early to, uh, to figure out uh, what's winning and what's losing, perhaps. What I do mention in the paper is uh, that the move is one towards accountability, if you will, um, as exemplified in the ILC articles on responsibility, of, as exemplified in the global administrative law approach, as uh, manifested in the whole discussion on constitutionalization that uh, in some pockets might still be ongoing. All of those focus on the responsiveness, if you will, or the legitimacy, if you will, or the accountability, uh, if you will, of international organizations. and are struggling, if you want to put it in those terms, are struggling to be fit into a functionalist framework. And my suspicion, it's not much more than that for the moment, I guess, despite a 40,000 word piece. But the suspicion is that functionalism is not really open to that. Functionalism seems to be very much a theory limited, structurally limited to relations between organization and member states and the only form of accountability then has to be fit within that relation and i'm not sure that works the, the discussions on uh, the haitian cholera affair make to my mind rather clear that all attempts to find the un somehow as 
non-immune or uh, responsible. No, but let's skip the word responsible here. It's, there is an element of responsibility. Um, all attempts to hold that the UN is, should not be immune are very difficult to fit into that functionalist framework. And that, that just does not seem to work very well. So I'm not sure whether functionalism has been replaced already uh, or whether it even will be replaced because there is still an enormous normative attraction coming from it. Even if the explanatory force is perhaps less than we always thought it would be. Um, so there's, there's a struggle between different conceptions, between the functionalist conception as organizations doing things for their member states and staying within that framework, and then a more governance-related conception, which would come with democratic legitimacy, which would come with accountability of one sort or another. That debate, that struggle is ongoing. And what I contend in the paper is that that struggle is literally a struggle between different conceptions which might be structurally incompatible. And in which actors might be schizophrenic. Uh, because in, in some aspects they would like functionalism, in other aspects they yeah. would resist. Yeah. What would you say, I think the uh, proponent, exponents, uh, prophets, disciples of global administrative law, they would jump in and say, that's exactly where global administrative law comes in. Mm -hmm. If a constructivist theories offers an addition to uh, and a replacement of various aspects, at least various aspects of functional explanatory power, global administrative law both identifies the problem with functionalism and also offers a set of a toolkit of potential remedies and one should look now uh, at international organization law, international institutional law with the lenses of global administrative law, which is aware of the problem, which is, has, has a different set of sensibilities. Do you think it's, it's there or it's a little bit uh, pretentious? Mm, <laughs> tough. I'm, I'm sympathetic to the global administrative law approach because I, I, I tend to come from similar uh, premises, if you will, or think from similar premises. I'm not sure whether it prov provides all answers, though. Uh, one problem, perhaps, is, um, shall I put this? Some of the challenges coming towards international organizations stem not from the organization itself, but from the outside world. And I'm not sure whether global administrative law has much of an answer to that. The problem with trade law is no longer whether imports uh, or exports should somehow uh, compensate for each other. The problem is trade versus environment, trade versus labor, trade versus human rights. Um, I'm not sure whether global administrative law is able to take that into account just yet. Not as well as they think they can. I'll uh, leave that uh, for, for your account. Um, the other thing is, uh, and that, that's been a pet project of mine for some time now, is that much of the accountability response generally is based on, on the ontological reasoning, the idea that somehow we can set rules, and if, if we just find the right rules, if we just find the right uh, tools, if you will, then the world will be a better place. And that may well be the case, but the rules tend to come with their own forms of limitation. So I'm not sure whether the deontological framework underlying the ILC articles, underlying the ILA uh, uh, work on accountability, or underlying the global administrative law approach, whether that will solve all problems. So uh, I want to... Uh, I, I tend to agree with this, and it's, we, we will see how it's unfolding, but at least I think a great virtue of the paper is to alert the reader. He has a different way of looking at what's happening and sort of set markers of what we should be watching, etc. Uh, there's one thing that I uh, did not find in the paper so much, and I want to ask you if it resonates with you as a third explanation uh, to the, the challenges and perhaps the decline of, but more to the challenge, which is not the normative challenge of accountability or the explanatory power of uh, constructivism as new identities being built around, but it's uh, 
an emergence, I think it's very noticeable in Europe, but it's noticeable in other parts of the world as well, uh, the importance of identity. In other words, national identities, uh, unit identities, polity identity, uh, you know, we are French, we are German, we feel that we are losing something important in terms of our self-understanding of ourself, something that is of value. And I don't want to paint it in pejorative terms. That's mm -hmm. the point I want to make this. Uh, it can be exploited by various proto-fascist uh, movements, but it, it doesn't have to be understood in those terms. And functionalism also is a challenge to that because International organization law, generally speaking, has a certain cultural flattening. Here are shared values, here are shared governance. Uh, so maybe part of the challenge also comes from that identitarian movement, which is resisting forms of internationalization, not because of democratic concerns, not because, uh, but because of identitarian concerns. That's not implausible, I would guess, but I haven't given that much thought. And as you said correctly, that's not in the paper, no. It's, uh, that's something to explore, perhaps, but... Uh, and yeah. you're, you're... So, I, I think there might be something to that because... But anyway, it's also food for thought for our listeners. I want to go back to two or three years ago. Uh, you, 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 you did some wonderful work where you were introducing virtue theory into our ways of thinking of uh, international organization. I think it even came before the sort of focus on functionalism, etc. How does that fit in with this? I'm just trying to find a sort of a, a connecting line in your own mm. intellectual trajectory, because I think that was, for me, a breakthrough in thinking. I'd never seen other people in the international law field introducing virtue theory. How does that fit into this picture? That's an ongoing project. It fits in in. Well, Maybe say a word about virtue theory and what you've done. Okay, with it. and yeah. then yeah, the underlying sentiment arose with me about a decade ago when I was asked to write something on constitutionalism in international organisations, and I read a phrase from Sir Ivor Jennings, the great British constitutionalist, that written in the middle of the Second World War, 1943 that sometimes the psychology of government is just as important as the organization of government. And that somehow resonated that yes, no matter how, it comes back to what I just said about the, the ontological underpinnings of global administrative law, etc. No matter how well we set up our rule systems, um, there remains a human element. One of the ways to capture that is by looking at virtue theory or virtue ethics which goes back to Aristotle in, uh, in some form, which is the idea that one should evaluate the behavior of, or one can evaluate the behavior of political actors or of people generally, not just by looking at whether they follow rules, but also um, by focusing on their character traits. That sounds a bit ephemeral, perhaps, and a bit idealistic, some would say. Um, not me. No, not you, I know, but uh, I often encounter a rather skeptical response to this. Um, uh, well, people say we think, uh, you know, there should be transparency and integrity, and then you find the person is a habitual liar. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the character traits to go with the values you profess, the, the, the values become empty. The values become empty, and, and legal rules are such that the envelope can always be pushed. Um, so one needs people in charge. This is how it relates to, to the current work I'm doing, which is a larger project on virtue ethics and global governance, looking at whether our global leadership, be it the, the people running international organizations, being international judiciary, be it uh, expert advisors, be it NGO leadership, whether they uh, act in accordance with the virtues in, in a broad and, and not terribly technical sense. Basically, it boils down to this. One can apply the laws, one can apply the rules, either honestly or dishonestly, either with hubris or with some humility. Um, what I'm trying to do in, in, in my current project is to try and find a framework, try and develop a framework to give that idea some hands and feet. Um, but it seems, uh, uh, maybe just yeah. a different way of saying what you're saying is 
That's it. It's a de-reification of international organizations and international organization law. In the same way that it was a big breakthrough some times ago when we disaggregated the state and we said we should not simply speak about the UK or France or China, but speak about the parliament of the UK and the, the executive branch of the UK and the judiciary and even other uh, uh, foci of social and political f uh, power and uh, sensitivity. So here it's taking it one step further and saying at the end of the day they're human beings uh, in a very real uh, flesh and blood and bones mm -hmm. who are always at the end of the day the ones who are applying the rules, interpreting the rules, judging the rules, etc. And if we don't focus on the real human element of those human beings uh, that we, we are missing a very big uh, part of the picture, and that might, of course, functionalism totally disregards that. Yep. Uh, functionalism is just not sensitive to the fact that it's a rarefying concept. Mm -hmm. as, as most uh, theories in this field are, uh, like most of our colleagues would focus on structures rather than on agents. So to, to focus on agents is, is already pretty rare in its but, own but right. But even agents, because the focus on agents is on human beings in their agency function, mm -hmm. but not actually as human beings, as human beings yeah. with vices and virtues. Yep. Uh, yep, fair enough. Yeah. Well, uh, I think this, if nothing else, this uh, should have whetted your appetite to go and read the piece for Jan, by Jan Klabez, the first forward to the European Journal of International Law. And I hope that those of you who have read the piece will have found this discussion illuminating, clarifying, and moving the ball a little bit further. Jan Klabas, thank you very much. Thank you.